Okay, thank you everyone for being here. It's great to see you all to be a part of this. I see we have newlyweds in the audience. Mr. Bailey? I see we have newlyweds in the audience. Congratulations. <laughs> So um, thank you for coming. We're going to get started uh, right away. Um, I want to say that uh, I, um, oh, maybe about a year ago, uh, was given a copy of the book Walkable Cities by uh, Rick Gonzalez, actually. And he said, you should read this. It's a good book. So I did. And after reading it, um, I really felt convinced that it would be great for our city to bring Jeff Speck in and take a look at what we're doing and how we're doing it. So um, Mr. Clemente has been the key resource um, in making this happen. So I'm going to turn the meeting over to Rafael. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and welcome everyone. Um, Rafael Clemente, I'm Executive Director of the Downtown Development Authority. Uh, we're really proud to have worked hand in hand with the city and the CRA on this. Uh, and I have to say I'm equally proud to see who's in the audience tonight. Uh, and I promise this wasn't a wedding gift for Jesse Bailey. Um, <laughs> But we have business owners, we have residents, we have local decision makers, we have FDOT, county, city, staff people who are going to be key to implementing what we learn out of this. Uh, and I would say, and, I, and I, would, I would surmise that the city will echo this, is this is an opportunity for a big step forward for us. Um, there is a tremendous amount of private investment being made in our city right now, huge, um, billions, more than a, more than a billion. Uh, and we have found ourselves in the past playing catch up with what the private sector's vision for our city has been. And now with this opportunity and working with Mr. Speck on learning how we can take that public realm and really make it function well for everyone, um, we're looking to position ourselves at least in step with, if not a step ahead of what's being brought to our city. So without saying too much about what we're going to learn, I want to introduce um, Jeff Speck, if you haven't seen him. Raphael, before you get yep. into introductions, I'm going to interrupt you. Please. Because I do see that we have our commissioner, Commissioner Burdick, here in the audience. So Thank you, Commissioner Burdick, for being here. I also want to thank Mr. Weissman from the county for, for also being here, Bob Weissman. Do you, I don't see any other elected official, do you? Okay. But thank you, thank you so much for being here, both of you. Appreciate it. Go ahead, Raphael. Thank you very much. I apologize for that omission. Um, no, it was mine. So we, um, we started this process in November with a, uh, an introduction. And then this, the research that has contributed to this study started in May. Uh, and it has been steady and consistent work um, up until last night, probably. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I would say take out your notepad and really pay attention to the details. Um, I think that if we, if we allow ourselves to think a little bit out of the box, we're going to really be able to take this a long way. And with that, Mr. Speck. Hello again, Hello again. Commissioners. Thanks, thanks for having me again. It's nice to see you again. A lot of familiar faces in the audience. Um, so I was here for, um, oh, and, and also I'm really grateful for the county, to the county for being here. I understand uh, there's some FDOT representatives as well, and that will, you'll see as we go why that's important. Um, I met with a lot of you when I was here for a week in May. I want to make the point that this, that I'm very careful to call this um, a walkability and an analysis and recommendations. It's not a plan. And I stress that it's not a plan because to be a plan, it would have had to involve a lot of public forums, a lot of uh, back and forth, and a cyclical, iterative process of hearing from you all and refining the product. But this is a, a much shorter, I should say, a much less expensive and a much um, more uh, technical type of study that I've taken to doing. Uh, this is about the 12th one that I've done. Um, I've done them in Fort Lauderdale, and I'm doing another one in Albuquerque right now. Um, and when I meet with folks, and those of you who met with me will remember this, I always say the same thing, which is, what's the purpose of this effort? It's to figure out how, in the shortest amount of time, spending the least amount of money, 
we can witness the greatest visible increase in the number of people walking and biking in the study area, which in this case happens to be downtown West Palm Beach. Um, I have given a couple talks here already. Uh, in fact, both of them were about an hour long. Um, there's two talks I like to give. One is called Why Walkability that explains the economic logic, the health-based logic, the environmental-based reasons why it's so important that we re reorient our cities and our communities around walking. Uh, and then I have another talk that I gave most recently here that talks about what it takes to get people to walk. That, you know, if a vital place is full of pedestrians, which is what most people have come to believe these days, um, how do you get people to walk? And I don't have time today, because I have so many recommendations to confer, I, I don't have time today to go through that talk again. I do believe it was taped and it's available at the closed circuit here, is that right, Raphael? Yes. Okay, and it's also now, as of yesterday, there's a short version of that that's a TED talk that's called The General Theory of Walkability. And the other one, is just called The Walkable City. That's also a TED Talk that I did. So if you're, if you're curious to learn more, um, you can access both of those talks. But today I'm really here to talk about West Palm Beach. So um, beginning with this question, if a vital place is full of pedestrians, how do you get people to walk? Um, and in this country, and in most of the cities in this country, where, where driving is just so easy, and the car sits between you and everything, um, and you don't pay the full cost of driving, to get people to walk, you have to offer a walk that's, that's better than a drive, which means, it, and this is the structure that I presented to you last time, it means the walk has to simultane simultaneously be useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting. For the purposes of this study and in describing West Palm Beach to you today, I've reoriented it. First, I've reorganized it. First, the comfortable, interesting walk had been combined, and we're gonna talk in this order today. The safe walk first, the comfortable and interesting walk second, and the useful walk third. So without further ado, let's get into what makes a walk safe and how that applies here. I'm gonna talk about having the right number of lanes, which means not too many, uh, proper signals that invite pedestrians, lanes of the right width, one-way streets not where you don't need them, protecting the curb, and welcoming bikes. The right number of lanes is a question, let's step back. Obviously, if you have more lanes than you have demand for lanes, then you have extra roadway that pedestrians have to cross that they shouldn't have to cross. You also have an encouragement in the wider roadway for, dr for cars to go faster. And you know as a driver that you feel more comfortable going faster on a four-lane street than you do on a two-lane street. So let's look first at Flagler. Flagler, and I'm, I'm jumping right into what I think is the first easiest win in this whole conversation. Flagler is a street that feels a lot like a highway that's separating you from one of your great downtown assets, which is your waterfront. And it, it is five lanes. It's four travel lanes plus a center turn lane. Um, and it is a barrier between you and the waterfront. So here's a diagram of what Flagler looks like now. And you see it's a five lane road. Now, here are the car counts. Here are the car counts we have for Flagler. They're all under, these are peak hour car counts, all under 1,000, and we have one daily car count, which is 10,000 cars per day, which corresponds with the other numbers you see there. Now, if you're a planner, one of the first things you learn is that 10,000 cars per day is easily handled on a two-lane street. And in my work, I'm always looking for disconnects between the number of cars and the number of lanes. And this is a clear disconnect on Flagler, that in fact, if you change Flagler to a three-lane street, it would still be able to handle 2,000 cars per peak hour in all of these places where it's currently handling less than 1,000 cars at peak hour. So you actually have twice the capacity at three lanes on Flagler than you currently need. So you can grow a heck of a lot by the way, vehicle miles traveled in this country, as you probably know, is falling. We're driving less than we did before. But in any case, with a three-lane road, you have more capacity than you could ever need. So what I'm proposing for Flagler is simply a conversion of the outer lanes. In the case up against the edge of the city, uh, you can add parallel parking and a buffer in that outer lane. And then against the waterfront, where there are no interruptions, no roads crossing it for about a mile, right? You can have a continuous bike lane. So the bikes no longer have to battle the pedestrians, who you know are all wearing earplugs uh, on the pedestrian walk 
along the waterfront edge. Then there's another condition where it already has parallel parking, and there, just to use up that extra roadway, the parallel parking can be turned into angle parking. And I'm suggesting rear end just because rear end is safer, but angle parking then on the curb, you can see that on the left side of the street with the bike lanes. It's called a cycle track. It's two lanes of biking. It's a, two, it's a two way bike path that's separated by a buffer on the flank of the road um, that has no curb cuts crossing it except at the bridges. Now I noticed in looking at Google, I didn't witness it personally, but I noticed looking at Google that there's uh, a lot of cases where this street is actually closed for car rallies, for the boat show. Um, so we know that the city does not grind to a halt when Flagler is entirely offline. But what I'm suggesting is just that we, um, using just paint, and most of my suggestions today are just using paint, that we remake Flagler into a street that's still double the capacity it's currently handling, but is a top grade bike facility and provides the parking. And if you're wondering why you can't get a restaurant east of Pistache to succeed, one reason is because that edge feels like a highway and because the city is separated from its best natural feature by the highway. So that's Flagler. Interestingly, and these are hard to see from where you're sitting, but if you, my study area essentially is from bridge to bridge downtown. But if you look further south, as I've done here, all the way to where Flagler basically begins, um, there are opportunities in every stretch to continue that bike facility and that parking facility. So what you see here is a five lane section, a three lane section, a two lane section, different parts of Flagler heading south, and then here different parts of Flagler heading north, four, four lane sections and a five lane section, where there's room in the roadway, both from extra lanes, but also from just lanes that are super wide and can be narrowed to the standard, and you'd have room for bikes and room for parking. So for me, that's an easy win, it's an inexpensive win, and I don't think people understand the full extent to which the separation from the intercoastal that Flagler provides is harming the vitality of your city. I think this is a very important change. South Dixie is a fun street to discuss. I know it's a F dot street, which means that doesn't mean nothing's possible. It just means it's a longer process and a more political process. South Dixie is what we call a classic road diet. Now I'll explain what that means. This is the before picture, happens to be now. Four lane road. F the classic road diet, which, are, which these things are being built all over the country, is a four to three road diet. Where you take a four lane road, where you see it's a dangerous road because the the fast lane is also the turning lane, and one line of traffic stops for you and the other may not as you turn. And it converts it to a three lane road, which gives you extra room for other stuff. Um, this is not surprising, that when you convert a four laner to a three laner, the number of injuries drops precipitously. This is the surprise. This is a chart of 17 different road diets, all four to three lane, all over North America, and you see that the number of cars being handled on the street does not drop. The average actually goes up very slightly. So the, the surprising lesson here is that a three lane street handles as many cars as a four lane street because four lane streets are extremely inefficient. So my recommendation for South Dixie, which you know, beginning at Okeechobee, after the turn lane takes you into the campus area there, there's a long stretch there, it's probably several miles, uh, maybe a mile, where there's intermittent parking on the east edge, no parking on the west edge, and a lot of businesses that are struggling because they don't have the curb parking, and a lot of residents that are complaining that the people are parking in their streets when they're frequenting the businesses. So my suggestion is to begin the discussion with FDOT about whether South Dixie can become a classic three-lane road diet. Proper signals, tricky discussion. You have push buttons here in West Palm Beach. Um, you know, one of my jobs is to travel around and look at best practices in other cities and bring them here. Uh, this is an image that we planners have been using with some uh, pleasure for some time now. Um, the fact is that as you look around the country, the cities that are known for being walkable, the cities, the cities that have significant pedestrian uh, populations, don't have push buttons. 
You might have a push button at a major crossing of a state highway or some other place where there's an unusual condition. But the standard condition in a Chicago or a Boston or even New York City with you know, five lane avenues is not a push button. It's a simple concurrent signal. Additionally here, the push buttons are very frustrating. Most people don't realize that the push button doesn't, well, they realize it when they try it. The push button doesn't get you the signal. Right? The, what the push button gets you is a longer signal to make sure that you're able to cross the street. And that is still an issue in some places. But if you've had the experience that I've had of pushing these buttons and waiting, what seems, what is, I've timed it sometimes two minutes or more to get the signal you jaywalk. And I have to say, I've crossed, I've crossed um, a quadrille maybe 40 times and I've jaywalked every time. Because you just don't want to wait and you take, you take your chances because uh, the signal is very frustrating. So what does it mean to have the sort of signals <clears throat> that are both safer and invite pedestrian activity, rather than simply prioritizing the flow of la what they call large squadrons of automobiles? The first is to only use push buttons where they're necessary and instead to have concurrent timing. That means when the cars get the green, you get the green. Second, where there's lots of pedestrians and the potential for a conflict between cars turning into intersections and pedestrians crossing, there's something called a lead pedestrian indicator that's now spreading around the country. And I recommend them at key places, like on, you know, for, for example, perhaps Dixie and um, um, Clematis, or better yet, Clematis and, and Okeechobee, sorry, Clematis and, and, and Quadrille, which it gives the pedestrian a three second lead. So the pedestrian's allowed to enter the crosswalk, claim the intersection before the cars enter. So I recommend those in certain key locations. Short cycles are really important because pedestrians hate to stand anywhere for more than 30 seconds or so. And again, the walkable cities, the San Francisco's, the Portland's, they rarely have a cycle longer, longer than 60 seconds for the whole cycle. Now the traffic engineers don't like this because yes, you can, you can move, I'm sorry, it's not squadrons, it's platoons. You can move more platoons of traffic. You can move more cars if the signals are longer. But if the objective is to move both cars and people, then a shorter cycle, a shorter cycle makes more sense. You do need buttons on your longer spans, but it's important to understand what that means. The typical person walks about four and a half feet per second. I walk six feet per second. This is three feet per second. Okay, it's not that fast. It's what we could call, you know, senior speed in the more challenge, you know, the people who are, the people who are out walking but aren't that comfortable walking and don't walk very fast. But three feet per, sec per second means um, that you probably only need push buttons on Okeechobee, Quadril, and maybe Flagler because those are the only crossings that are that long. So I know you've got the buttons there, I know you've invested in them, uh, but the fact is that, that if you want to adopt the national best practices, you will convert them to simple concurrent signals without push buttons, except where you have these long spans. Next, lanes of the right width. This is probably the biggest, most important discussion we have to have today, because when you make your lanes the right width, all kinds of stuff becomes possible. Uh, Andre Stwani likes to say the typical road to the typical subdivision in America has become so wide that you can see the curvature of the earth. And what's happened, of course, is that the standards have changed from this is a subdivision in the 60s and this is a subdivision in the 80s. And the standards have changed for all of our roads where we have this widening that's happened. People go faster on wider streets. Why is that important? Well. If you're hit by a car going 35 miles an hour, you are 10 times as likely to die than if you're hit by a car going 25 miles an hour. So that cusp of around 30 miles an hour is super important. And the width of your streets and the width of your lanes are often what get people above or below that cusp. So according to one study, increased lane widths are responsible for approximately 900 additional traffic fatalities per year. Citizens understand this, they demand narrower streets when they have a chance. And then the ITE acknowledges this, that's the Institute of Transportation Engineers who wrote th this book, it's approved by the Federal Highway Administration, calling in downtown areas for 10 foot lanes, 11 foot lanes um, versus 12 foot lanes. Most places I work and here, if I sound a little frustrated, it's because I'm fighting this exact same battle in Montana, in New Mexico, and in a dozen other states. 
is the 12 foot standard which states and counties, every state I've worked and every county I've worked, it's a standard they've imported from highway design and brought it into city design. And a lot of states and counties and frankly cities, like cities in, in South Dakota, it's the standard, a 12 foot standard, which we new urbanists believe is a much more dangerous standard. So this is, this is the two measures, which you'll find, you'll see in a minute, become super important, 12 feet versus 10 feet. It's what they say versus what we say. So what's the evidence? I'm gonna to talk to you about crash rates, crash severity, and traffic impacts. First of all, in terms of crash rates, I just showed you this. This was not done by a traffic engineer, so it doesn't count. You have to belong to the priesthood or you will not be listened to. So what does the priesthood say? AASHTO, this is called the Green Book, it's the Bible of street design, the policy of geometric design of highways and streets. For rural and urban arterials, arterials are wide, busy streets. Lane widths may vary from 10 to 12 feet. Now bear in mind, most of your streets are not arterials. Right, the arterials are your streets that are handling a lot of traffic. Smaller streets with less traffic can be narrower, but 10 to 12 feet, so we're okay so far. 12 foot lanes should be used where practical on higher speed, free flowing, principal arterials. However, under signalized conditions, operating at speeds below 45 miles an hour, narrower lane widths are normally quite adequate and have some advantages, so we're okay with Ashto. There's Okeechobee, see the 40 mile an hour speed limit, so it's below 45 miles an hour. Here's the Midwest Research Institute, another stodgy, old school traffic engineering organization. NCHRB Project 372, the relationship of lane width to safety. A safety evaluation of lane widths for arterial roadways. Now let, me let me interrupt myself to say I have to do this, because if I don't do this, we're gonna go away, I'm gonna go away, and the DOT, or maybe not your DOT, but Someone's gonna say, we can't do 10 feet because 12 feet is safer. And I'm trying to prove to you that it's not. A safety evaluation of lane widths for arterial roadway segments found no indication, except in limited cases, that the use of narrower lanes increases crash frequencies. The lane width effects in the analyses conducted were generally either not statistically significant or indicated that narrower lanes were associated with a lower rather than higher crash frequencies. Another study by traffic engineers NCHRP 330. All projects evaluated during the study that consisted of lane widths exclusively of 10 feet or more, in other words, we're looking from 10 to 12, resulted in accident rates that were either reduced or unchanged from 12 feet. Narrower lane widths, less than 11 feet, can be used effectively in urban arterial street improvement projects where the additional space can be used to relieve traffic congestion or address specific accident patterns. That's crash rates. Crash severity, we already talked about this. Clearly the faster you're going, the more people die. But I have to prove to you that wider lanes make people go faster, because even though you and I all know that, we need proof. And let me interrupt myself again to say that if I have another beef with traffic engineers, it's how few of these studies are done. It is really, really hard to, to find data. And the data I'm showing you today is all we've got. It's all that I could find, and I work with a lot of engineers, this is all that we could find. Project summary report, design factors that affect speed on suburban arterials. The Texas Transportation Institute is as conservative as they get. On suburban arterial straight sections away from traffic signals, higher speeds should be expected with greater lane widths. Okay, that's the only study, but that's what it says. Suburban arterial straight sections away from traffic signals, just like Okeechobee. I'm sorry, between, in other words, between the traffic signals on Okeechobee. Finally, traffic impacts. Oh, we're only concerned about safety, right? But traffic matters because, let's face it, if all we cared about was safety, then Okeechobee would be 20 miles an hour. But it's not 20 miles an hour because we care about volume. Well, the only study I could find was done by FDOT. And what FDOT's study said, so long as all other geometrical and signalization conditions remain constant, there is no measurable decrease in urban street capacity when through lane widths are narrowed from 12 feet to 10 feet. So there you have it, okay? Lane, lanes narrower than, 10, than 12 feet down to 10 feet are not more dangerous. Wider lanes cause people to go faster, which we know results in higher death rates, and it does not impact traffic to switch from 12 foot lanes to 10 foot lanes. Excuse me, Jeff. Yes. Folks, we have lots of seats here. You wanna come in and sit down, there's plenty of 
seats in the front and on the side. So please grab a seat. If I had found contrary evidence, I would have presented it to you. And I welcome FDOT or the county or anyone else who wishes to challenge the 10-foot standard to present contrary evidence. But that's all the evidence that I could find. So why should FDOT care? Why should FDOT and the county care? This just released is the list of the most dangerous places for pedestrians in America. Have you noticed anything similar about the first four? They're all in Florida. Orlando, Tampa, Jacksonville, Miami. Then look about six columns in at the pedestrian danger index. Orlando is, a, is, a, is the worst by far, but you see that it's a precipitous decline until you start to level off in, you know, around Memphis or Birmingham. There's something going on in Florida. Part of it is the elderly population. That is certainly a factor, but there's a lot more of it which makes Miami, sorry, that makes Florida different from most other states I've worked, which is the large number of state highways that happen to run through downtowns that, are, that have 12-foot lanes and have highway geometrics in urban areas. And so if you care to change this, and FDOT does, and FDOT is doing study after study to make it safer for pedestrians, then you need to acknowledge that 10 feet is safer and allow it to happen. Here's all the pedestrians that have died in this area, just pedestrians, in the last 10 years. <clears throat> so let's talk about Okeechobee which is the one dot in my study area on this map, happens to be at Okeechobee near Rosemary. It's four to five lanes in each direction. Uh, this, this still image does not convey the experience that I'm sure many of you have had of standing on that sidewalk four feet away from the SUV going 50 miles an hour. Um, this is the proposal. And what this shows, because you, I, I know that I will not be successful in asking FDOT to limit the capacity on Okeechobee. I also acknowledge that Okeechobee is often very congested. So we're not trying to reduce the capacity. If you change those 12-foot lanes that you see on the top to the 10-foot lanes you see on the bottom, it gives you eight extra feet of roadway. If you make that eight extra feet a bicycle track, a cycle track, one in each direction with a high curb protecting the bicycle, for the price of dropping in those curbs and restriping the road, you have a street which not only is a bicycle facility that's much needed, but a safe street for pedestrians to walk along because they're no longer right up against that traffic. So very simple. I'm, uh, I propose something similar in several different places where I'm working, and it always gets stuck because FDOT will not, or because, sorry, the local DOT will not go below 12 feet. And I'm hoping I've made a strong enough case why 10 feet is better and why we can do something like this on Okeechobee. Uh, where Okeechobee becomes... Hasn't, hasn't FDOT just recently agreed to go to 10 feet in Fort Lauderdale? Um, I'm not sure about Fort Lauderdale. I know there's a, uh, there's a, Ju there's a bridge up in Jupiter yeah, yeah. where they're close to 10 feet. Uh, I'm, uh, and by the way, most DOTs have 10 feet in their standards. They just really hate to do it. And my hope is that this is a powerful enough argument for it to happen on Okeechobee simply where it passes through the downtown. Now where Okeechobee splits into Okeechobee and Lakeview, there's a two-lane section, there's a three-lane section. You have extra shoulder in the roadway. You can see, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. There's, you can see on the upper right, actually the upper left and the upper right, there's even a shoulder in the roadway. Shoulders don't belong in urban streets. Shoulder is a country thing. It's a highway thing. So again, if you make the lanes the right width, you can continue those eight-foot bike lanes all the way to the bridge where there's bikeways alongside the road. So now we have a regional scale bicycle facility connecting across the entirety of the, um, what do you call it? The isthmus. I used to live on it, but I don't know what it's called. Um, there's Okeechobee again, and you see the, the key intersections with Sapodilla and with Rosemary in the center and to the right of center. Uh, both have had a lot of accidents on them. Rafael Clemente, who introduced me, was hit by his daughter on their bicycles at Sapodilla, and the injuries to prove it. Um, and a study was done by, by uh, Tom Hall, uh, and I could say we've had some nice contentious debates over the internet, and I can tell you he is a, he is a traditionally oriented, in a good way, traditionally oriented traffic engineer, uh, who he and I would find many things to disagree with, but in his study, which is precisely because this hotel is coming across Rosemary, um, he's proposed some changes to this intersection, which I agree with and which I want to add to. So his principal recommendations here um, are to make pedestrians more visible through certain techniques, 
to revise the shape of the median because the gaps are too big and swoopy, and I'll show that to you, and to create some pedestrian shelters in the median so pedestrians are happy cr crossing and waiting, waiting in the middle for that other light. So here's how it looks right now, and here's my proposal, which picks up from his. And look at the two, and actually I can put them side by here, they are side by side. What you see is, first of all, <clears throat> look how big and swoopy the gap is where Rosemary is crossing Okeechobee. That's a two-lane road. At, at no time is ever more than one car going, e going north or one car going south. And so if you narrow it to a 24-foot two-lane road and shape the corners for the speed at which we want the cars to drive, you all of a sudden have an incredibly different experience crossing. You have this much longer refuge. You have a lower speed geometry, which again corresponds to the speeds that FDOT wants to see. Right? It's no longer a highway. It's the center of an urban boulevard. The other thing you'll see is, of course, as, as Tom mentioned, more visible crosswalks. I've also proposed closing the slip lane. See in the lower right? There's no reason that traffic volumes demand that additional slip lane that takes you out of the convention center area east on Okeechobee. So making, making it into a simple crossed intersection. And then I propose, I propose trees in the median just to get FDOT mad because they don't typically like trees. Um, although they've, there are palms in the median now, I'm recommending deciduous trees much closer to the intersection than FDOT wants them. But I would hope that at least, at least half of those trees could remain. That's Okeechobee. Quadrille is, I think, a street where we allow a lot to happen. Because it is a state street, we have much less control over it. Um, it's a street that, by allowing it to be the carrier of a ton of traffic, takes a lot of pressure off of many other streets. And frankly, it's not a street that many people will have that much reason to walk along. It's a street which we have reason to cross, and we want to make the crossing as good as possible. But Quadrille, and then it has this curve. You know, and you don't really see curves in cities. You see curves in highways, you see curves at the Indianapolis 500 that look like this. And if you add up the track and the, and the pit lane, you get the width of quadrille. And the reason quadrille, and then there's all this stuff that, that says, you know, vehicular highway, does not say pedestrian street. And by the way, it's not my job to acknowledge any of the good things. So yes, there are trees, yes, you know, these could, everything I'm showing you could be much worse, and people deserve credit for how far they've come but I want to bring up the things that still need work, such as you know, striping that were at a, an area of parallel parking, for example, would bring down the speeds on the road. And again, we have this 12-foot standard. So you can see here that four lanes are almost filling 50 feet. So you have a similar opportunity to introduce either bike lanes or parallel parking along this street. And because of where it's located, and frankly, because of a big development that's currently uh, slated to arrive along this curve, I think the solution for Quadrille is you know, to switch to 10-foot lanes where there's no median, because where there's a median, that limits you. But to switch to 10-foot lanes and add parallel parking against the eastern and southern curb as you come around that corner, and that'll just calm the street. And then that sidewalk that you see there, completely unprotected, that's going to have buildings facing it, will be a safe sidewalk to walk on because the cars will be there in between you. The parked cars will be there in between you and the moving vehicles. Now, Tamarind is a city street, so I don't have to convince anyone but the city about the lane widths there. And Tamarind is one of these classic 12-foot, five-lane streets uh, that's alongside a railroad track. So that's interesting. There's no curb. There's very few curb cuts on the north side of the street. It also is the street that kids from the School of the Arts walk along to get to the train station. And so what I'm proposing for Tamarind, again, is by switching to the 10-foot lanes, you get, in this case, 10 feet on the west side of the street that can be a protected cycle track alongside the rail right-of-way, essentially. So very few interruptions. And now we have an important east-west, sorry, important north-south bike corridor along the west coast, if you will, of downtown. Restripe. <laughs> I show this to remind you. Most of the things I'm going to be asking for are not expensive, and I'm, I'm looking for ways to just do it with paint. Stripes and signals are all you need to accomplish almost all the things that I'm going to recommend today for your streets. Banyan, similarly, 
Five lanes, 12 foot lanes, feels like a highway. Another opportunity to move from, in some cases, on the left, what you see is, you know, always the before is on the top and the after is below. What you see on the left is in places where there's less commercial, it makes sense to have a protected bike lane. In places where there is commercial, it makes sense to introduce parking. And there's this part of Banyan here, where there, is it SunTrust who just remade that, that building so nicely? Chase. Uh, Chase, excuse me, just remade that building. Look at the middle of this road. Those are two 18-foot travel lanes, right? So you have an opportunity here to shorten the left-hand turn lanes to have parking on one side of the street continuously and intermittently away from the corners on the other side of the street. So these are things that protect the curb, that slow the cars down. These are free flow, 10-foot, perfectly luxurious lanes, but that wait getting rid of that excess roadway. Now, Rosemary is, in some ways, your best, your best street. Rosemary and Clematis, of course. Um, we knew we were going to show this picture all around the world about successes in West Palm Beach. Uh, and this part of the street, it's a perfect mixing street. Everyone moves slowly. People don't like the traffic, but the traffic makes it a safe street for pedestrians, for bicyclists, and for cars. Um, but then there's other parts, like by the courthouse, where all of a sudden, the need to enter a parking facility has turned this into a highway with buffers. And I understand the need for turn lanes, but we don't need fat lanes, we don't need buffers. And actually, if you make the lanes 10 and 11 feet, you have room for, for a full-fledged bike lane here. You'll see, I'm, I'm going to show you, a, 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 I'm, I'm proposing a full bike plan for the downtown, but I'll be hinting at the different components of it as we go. I'm certainly not recommending bike facilities in every street, but at Rosemary is the obvious north-south corridor. Now, most of it, the bikes can just mix freely with traffic. It's the obvious north-south corridor in the middle, in the middle of your downtown. In certain places, bikes can mix freely with traffic. <clears throat> in other places, though, where there's room, we use up the extra roadway, which induces speeding with the bike lanes. Next, questioning one ways. So, Dixie and Olive, the big question when I arrive here, everyone wants to know, will you be recommending converting Dixie and Olive back? And I didn't arrive here with any predisposed notions, although I should say I already knew it from having been here before, and of course, this is an issue that we've been addressing all around the country for some time, and I do have my, um, I think, evidence-based inclinations, which don't seem to be contradicted in this case. The, there's a business discussion and there's a safety discussion. The business discussion principally um, is that many cities have reverted, well let's just start by saying many cities in the 60s and 70s reverted their two-way street networks to one-way street networks and with a marked and uh, well-documented decline in businesses along those streets. Other cities like Vancouver, Washington have converted, ha have had main streets. This, the story of Vancouver, Washington was written up in Governing Magazine. They have this main street that they could not resuscitate, then they converted it back to two-way from one-way, and the revenues in the stores doubled almost immediately. So there's also the story of East Broad Street in Savannah, where in 69 it was converted to one-way. 64% of the business addresses went away. Then they reverted it in 1990 to two-way, and almost immediately, there was 50% new businesses on that street. I've seen no contradictory evidence in this discussion. So here are your current one-way streets in the downtown. You can see the Northwest Quadrant, which we'll talk about, and you can see where Okeechobee splits, and you can see Dixie and Olive, and then some very narrow streets near the waterfront that I wouldn't suggest changes to. <clears throat> here is Dixie and Olive. And I'm not sure if you can read this, but the, the car counts, the peak hour car count on Dixie is 6,600. The peak hour car count on Olive is 7,200. Now, that's enough to be handled. We, we know that a two-lane street can handle 10,000 cars per day. So the, it's clear that from, from the counts here that there is excess capacity in these streets. Now, would a single two-lane road, two-way road, handle 7,000 trips in one direction and 6,500 trips in the other direction? No, it would be a little tough. But two two-way roads certainly can. So I am proposing, because the business reasons make it clear that these streets are better, 
uh, I am proposing the two-way conversion. I understand that there are agreements in place between the county and the city that presuppose that it stay as a one-way pair. I'm not here to analyze what the agreements are that are in place. I'm here just to, to make an assessment as to what's better for West Palm Beach. And I do believe that all of your struggling businesses, um, all of your businesses along Dixie and Olive, some of which will, are struggling, will do better with those streets as two-way streets. However, we have to pay attention to other factors. For example, the fact the trolley's on it and the fact that people do deliveries on it, blocking one of the lanes. We can't begin the conversion without addressing the delivery issue. There need to be plans made for placing deliveries on perpendicular streets and in other locations or at other hours of the day. But the, the, I want to acknowledge that it's, it's, a, it's an issue that must be addressed. That said, as you know, there have been many of these conversions all around the country, and it has always been addressed, and it has been solved. In terms of the trolley, there are times when you'll be stuck behind a trolley that will make you go slower. <laughs> but you will also have the opportunity, particularly in a two-way system, in a two-way system to jockey one street over and continue your path. So if you find yourself behind a trolley and you aren't happy about it, the other street will always be there. So an interesting thing happens when you convert two-lane one-ways to two-way streets. This is the current, these are the current signals in downtown West Palm Beach. Every yellow dot is a signal at an intersection. When you convert, think about where, for example, Dixie or Olive cross Clematis. Right now that street needs a signal because you've got a couple lanes of traffic in one direction intersecting with Clematis. When you have a typical two-lane street intersecting a typical two-lane street, both two-way, you now may not need the signal. You can get rid of a lot of those signals. It's a little hard to see. I'm going to flex it back and forth here. The, the signals that are striped with X's are signals that I believe can go away when the two-way, sorry, when the one-way one -way is converted to two-way. Additionally, there are a couple more signals, you can see them here, that I believe uh, you don't need. And then finally, there's a couple places where you need signals and you don't have them. For example, crossing to get to the train station at Clematis and at Datora and uh, at the Quadrille Fern intersection. Fern is about to become a much more important street when Datora and Avernia are closed. So I do recommend a new signal there. So ultimately I'm recommending this, oh and then, and then these, are, these then are the stop signs that I would recommend. Some of them are four-way, most of them are four-way, some of them are two-way because one degree, one, one direction of flow dominates. So the ultimate condition I'm recommending, this shows kept signals in yellow, new signals in red, new stop signs in red with the numbers in them. And the stop sign is the, the four-way stop sign is the new roundabout in planning. Four-way stop signs are a dream for pedestrians. They're great for cyclists because everyone's looking at everyone else, everyone's looking at everyone else in the eye. Generally the cyclist unfairly is given the pass and allowed through. And you know as a pedestrian, well not everyone feels this way. So I actually felt I had to prove it. And I'll get to that in a minute. So what's the evidence then? If I'm suggesting converting signals to stop signs because I believe, I thought from my experience, that stop signs were safer, what proof do I have? Again, there are very few studies. In fact, there's only one study, but it's a huge study. It's a study that was done in Philadelphia. 472 signals were removed in Philadelphia at two-lane meets two-lane intersections. Data was collected on 199 of them, and they found that crashes reduced 24%. Severe injury crashes reduced 63%. That's the only study we have. Severe pedestrian injury crashes reduced 68%. So given that it's been my experience that most planners feel this way and that the only study we have studying 199 intersections concludes that there's a tremendous positive impact to pedestrians, I'm recommending the replacement of certain signals with stop signs in your downtown. This is interesting. Traffic engineers in Philadelphia believe that the safety benefit stems from the elimination of the local habit of speeding up to beat the red, as if they only do that in Philadelphia. <laughs> it's, a, it's a human habit. I do it. I drive. I have a car. I have an SUV, thank you. I take kids to school and I have seven seats. 
then I speed up at yellow lights. <laughs> and sometimes I like to walk. <laughs> um, but then there's your story. And this is Ian, Lo you know Ian Lockwood. Ian Lockwood, world famous from West Palm Beach. This is his slide. But of course, you have the best story of all of a one-way to two-way conversion, what you did with Clematis Street. And I actually find it kind of surprising that there's resistance here to the conversion of Dixie and Olive when you have one of the best examples in the whole country of what can happen when you revert a one-way street back to a two-way street. And I was writing this part up in the report, which I'm handing in in about a month, and just trying to think of a better way to put it. And all I can say, and, and I, I, I welcome contrary evidence, but all I can say is in my 20 years as a planner, with hundreds of these conversions happening all around the country, I've never heard of a single example where people were not grateful when it was over. Dana, do you have any stories contrary? Dana Little who helped me with Treasure, uh, Treasure Coast. Um, there's no example of anyone regretting it. And the traffic engineers tell you it will be Carmageddon and you'll have gridlock. And that's what happened in Oklahoma City. They said gridlock and we did it. And not even during construction was there a traffic problem. So, uh, you know, I try to run an evidence-based practice and that's the evidence. That this, this doesn't have to be the, the story. Okay, the Northwest Quadrant is the other area where I noticed a bunch of, where there are a bunch of one-way streets. And I'm not sure why these were put in. There used to be a feeling in the um, SEPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design community, that the more you, you walled a community, the more you isolated the community, the more that you limited the ins and outs to that community, the safer it was. That has since been disproved. I'm curious if these one ways were put in there for that reason. But in any case, the streets are wide enough. Douglas is one way, division is one way, Sapodilla is one way. In all cases, there's at least 16 feet clear. Now, 16 feet clear is what you find in another neighborhood, Grandview Heights, where you have New Jersey and New York and Palm and Penn. So I don't have to convince anyone that it works because another neighborhood not too far away has it already. So I'm also recommending then this conversion of these streets and a little bit of Rosemary, which is inexplicably, and I sent some emails around, nobody knows why that short segment of Rosemary north of 7th is one way. But in any case, that's part of what I'm recommending for reversion. Because two-way streets create more, two-way streets create more opportunity for conflict, which sounds bad, but it's the opportunity for conflict that makes drivers slow down. And that's why New York and New Jersey and Palm, why there's such, why there's such great safe feeling streets. <clears throat> so when you're all said and done, this is the one way system I'm recommending. Just the remainder, just, the, just, just Okeechobee and those small streets like Chase and the end of Clematis. Protecting the curb, parallel parking, as I mentioned, is a barrier of steel that protects the sidewalk for pedestrians. I was astounded at the number of, oh, I want to say, this is Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and I showed this last time I was here, but this is uh, happy hour in Fort Lauderdale. And you see here on one side of the street you're allowed to park, and on the other side you're not. This is happy hour on the parked side of the street, and this is happy hour on the not parked side of the street. Because no one wants to sit or walk, you know, next to a bunch of cars moving 60 feet per second. So I was amazed at the amount of streets you had, which just inexplicably, didn't, both inexplicably had no parking, and explicably, but things we can fix. So you had a lot of cases, I think this is Sapodilla, where parking is simply disallowed in a place where, oh, this, is, this is Clematis, south of Sapodilla. Parking is simply, dis, it's like there's a rule, you can't park on street next to a parking deck, I guess. So you can't park there, you can't park north of the parking deck on Sapodilla, even though it's a street which has plenty of parking all the way along it. Here's another example. So I'm collecting all these slides of streets that have curbs that you can park in some places but not others for reasons, reasons I don't understand. Then here, I find it hard to believe that on Quadrille, in the very back of this slide, you can see the red roof of it right here. There's a, I find it hard to believe that the buses, that six buses stop at once and use up this entire length of bus stop. So here's a place where more parking is possible. Here's a place in front of the courthouse where I'm guessing, uh, I, I was guessing for um, Homeland Security reasons that you had to have two travel lanes south 
on Dixie and only one north because the south one is a lane you're not allowed to park in. But then I noticed the other side of the courthouse, you can park on the curb. So I, I know the car count suggests that we could have a parking lane here. And then there's just some cases, I believe this is Chase, where you just have an over wide lane. This, way, this lane is wide enough for a 12 foot traveling and an eight foot parking lane. So you can bring parking back there. And then you have the streets with parallel parking that should be angle. These streets were paved for angle parking and at some point they were changed to parallel parking. You also have angle parking that should be parallel. <laughs> That's just another story. I only noticed that here in West Palm Beach. But more parallel that should be angle, parallel that should be angle. You're, 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 you have half the parking that you should on these streets. And you know parking spaces are money for your, re for your retailers and for your residential developers. So this is a little, perhaps a little hard to see, but what you see in, in black here, mostly, well I'm not gonna take the time to point, but mostly in this area, is you see a whole bunch of parking spaces that are just missing parking lanes. These are all the parking spaces you get by right sizing lanes. Remember I talked about Banyan and Quadrille and switching from 12 foot lanes to 10 foot lanes. That gets you all these parking spaces. Then these are the new parking spaces you get by turning parallel spaces into angle where they should be angle. 490 missing parking spaces in your city. That's the size of a nice structure. And what does a parking structure cost to build? What does it cost you to build and finance? So I'm suggesting that there's an economic reason as well as a um, safety reason for reintroducing these parking spaces. Now in all honesty, you'll see, you'll see why I'm about to recommend removing about 50 parking spaces by converting Fern from angle to parallel. Um, so we end up with a total of, of, four, of 430 new spaces that I'm recommending for you. It's a rough estimate, but I'm, I think I'm pretty close. <coughs> Averni is a prime example of that, just to show you one of a street that's wide enough for 45 degree angle parking. And by the way, I show head in parking because it's, less re it's the path of least resistance. Um, we do know that, angle, that rear in parking is safer. I always tell cities, I want you to have it, but I don't want to be the one to bring it to you because people complain a lot. But rear in parking is much safer, especially for bicycles. So let's talk about Rosemary. Here's a stretch of Rosemary that actually is not an arterial just a little bit north of the heart of downtown. And you see the dual problem. The bicyclist doesn't feel safe in the over wide street, so he's on the sidewalk, and these shops are struggling with no parking in front of them. In fact, people do park in front of them, and the street works perfectly fine with parking in front of them, because there's room for nine foot travel lanes and seven foot parking lanes. And in, in cities all over America, you see nine foot parking lanes, we have plenty of, eight, sorry, nine foot driving lanes, we have plenty of eight foot driving lanes in DC on slower streets. In Albuquerque, there are a lot of streets downtown where I just was that are, not, that are 7997, parking, drive, drive, park. There's no reason why this stretch of Rosemary, one block, couldn't have nine foot lanes, which would allow you a seven foot parking lane. The shops would do better and the bikes would feel safe. And then welcoming bikes. So I talk a lot about Portland. This is a typical, this is not bike to work day in Portland, this is a typical biking day in Portland. We know across the country that the presence of bicycle commuters is not a function of climate, not a function of topography, but it's a, there, are, there are twice as many bicyclists in San Francisco as there are in Denver. And you know Denver's flat and San Francisco isn't. Um, climate is a factor but it's not the dominant factor. The dominant factor is, is, um, is infrastructure. When you provide good cycling infrastructure, like here in Chicago with these buffered bicycle lanes, you see the parked cars and then the buffer that protects the bike lane, then the population doubles, or in New York City, quadruples. In Pasadena, they say every lane is a bike lane, which is why this is the only cyclist I met in Pasadena. If you don't have infrastructure, you won't have bikers. <laughs> and so, I have to say, I've worked all, you know, I'm working all over the place. This is the, the worst before picture I've ever shown. This is your current bike facility map. And what you basically got is some places where you're going over a bridge. You have some streets that are share rows, but share rows don't really cause people to choose to bike. So, and here's what I'm proposing. It's a little hard to read, but I'll take you through it. I already described how in Okeechobee, there's room for, with 10, 10 foot travel lanes, there's room for, for cycle track. I described how on Tamarind, there's room for cycle track with 10 foot travel lanes. Rosemary is a mixing street, that's what yellow means, 
with room for lanes in front of that, in front of that courthouse parking lot, and then again, it's a mixing street. Fern we're gonna get to, but Fern is about to be remade because there's a grant to do so, and Fern is about to become a much more important street because of the closing of Datora and Avernia. And then you have something that I might change before the final report, which is Banyan, which certainly as I described has room for either parking or bikes. I thought when I did this that it made sense to switch it on Rosemary to third so that we could get parallel parking on this part of Banyan. And I'll be interested in your opinions, but I'm beginning to believe that actually it'll be a much more effective bikeway if Banyan continues as the bikeway, which means less parallel parking, but at least it's a straight shot. So what you have here, you know, there are other streets in which bikes can mix with traffic, and there are other streets like Quadrille where bikes won't go. But what you have here is a sparse network that has three, oh, and then I mentioned Flagler, of course, early on. So you have a sparse network here of three nicely spaced north-south corridors where you're either protected, slow moving, or protected. And three east-west corridors where you're either protected, uh, in this case, well actually all three of them I'm gonna be proposed as protected ways. So this, this is what bike plans look like. It's not every street, but it's key corridors that become understood. And by the way, it's good not to have every street. Because if you distribute bikes among every street, then, then there aren't that many on any street. And actually it's the large number of bikes that make the cars aware. So, so concentrating is actually good for safety. So you have places like Rosemary where you can see the left here in the dark, a couple bicyclists just sharing the road. <coughs> and we saw that. And then you, you have this bike share facility that's coming. And uh, I took the liberty, and I didn't spend much time on it, and I welcome comment here, but I took the liberty of making some changes to it as well. What you see in green are the places where the bike share stations are going to be, let lo are going to be, are going to be located. I thought that you were missing some key areas and also that there was some redundancy. The ones with red X's through them are near other ones, very close, like a block away from other ones. So presuming a limited budget, I said, what if we remove these and then we insert these, the ones you see in purple? That allows you to access all the students in college to the south. It puts two along the waterfront where a lot of people are biking or will be biking along the edge of the intercoastal. It puts one at the train station. Shouldn't there be one at the train station? And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, there's already one at the train station, forgive me. It puts one where all the office workers are who have to often go to the courthouse. See that to the west? It puts one over there. Train station is already served. It puts one at the, uh, is it Kravis Center? Yes. Kravis Center. Um, and those are, the, those are the changes that I recommend, which leads to this new, this new diagram. And here are the two together. Here's your comprehensive bike plan that I'm recommending. Now, I wasn't hired to give you a bike plan, but this is a, a first stab that requires some more attention, but I have some confidence in it. Now, Fern Street has received a grant to be improved. And, I, and here's what it looks like now. You know it needs improvement, but it's going to become a more important street. I think it's going to become a more important street where its angle parking uh, um, provision is less important than its traffic and, frankly, bikeway provision. So here's a piece of the plan that's a very nice plan that's been proposed. Parts of it have angle parking. Parts of it have parallel parking. They look like this. But I have to say this is a mistake to show bicycle sharrows next to head-in parking because that's a bad, dangerous situation for, pedestrian, for bicyclists. I have to say it's something that I can't fix on the block between um, Quadrille and Rosemary because it was just built very expensively and beautifully, head in angle parking on that block of Fern. So that, that block's gonna remain a challenge. But here's what I'm suggesting. To the north you see the proposal. It, it occurs in two different forms. You have a parallel park area and you have, a angle, you have an angle parked area, area and you have a parallel parked area. You have quite large sidewalks, 13 foot sidewalks, which I think for the amount of retail activity that's going on on Fern is, is more than you need. So I'm suggesting narrowing the sidewalks to eight feet and creating, and you can see it here in the drawing, get my arrow going, here in the drawing you see what I showed you in Chicago, parallel parking, buffer, and then a cycle track 
against one of the curbs. Two-way tra- two two bikes on one side of the street, a protected cycle facility for the full length of this, of this reconstruction. Now, where you do have a restaurant and where you do want to have a wider sidewalk, I'm showing this, for example, and this. These are pervious decks that you can lay between the trees in the tree strip to expand the sidewalk. The trees will still get the water they need. Your sidewalk will be wider where you need it to be. But essentially, I'm giving, because one of the, one of the requirements of the grant was to have a lot of drainage area for stormwater. So it's important that the sidewalk not to be too wide, that we still provide all that green space. So that's what I'm recommending for Fern, this sort of facility. <clears throat> so there's the bike plan. We are done with the safe walk. The talk is probably half done. <laughs> I know I have two hours. Let's see what time it is. All right, we're right on schedule. Thank you for your continued attention. <laughs> The comfortable and interesting walk have to do with buildings lining streets and shaping spaces. All animals simultaneously seek both prospect and refuge. We want to feel that our flanks are covered, that we're protected from attack. It's in our DNA, we can't help it. It's why we go to Europe on vacation to enjoy plazas like this, and a plaza is only as good as its edges. And we planners have been talking about this for some time. What's the proper ratio of height to width? You know, one to three, three to one. Well, we know six to one in Salzburg is spectacular. Um, and the opposite is Houston. But the point of this is to say that it's typically the surface parking lot or some other sort of empty lot that's causing us to lose that sense of spatial definition that makes us comfortable, makes us comfortable in a space. But of course, the ratio itself isn't enough. One to one is the Renaissance ideal. This is the Renaissance ideal, but as I joke in Grand Rapids, which is otherwise quite a walkable city, if one side of your street is an exposed parking deck and the other side is a conference facility that's apparently been designed in admiration for the exposed parking deck, <laughs> then no one will walk on that street. And so we need to have edges up against sidewalks, of course parking behind, and we need those edges to be lively and active. So, this leads into the urban triage exercise I'm going to take you through. It also leads to a discussion of all aboard Florida, street trees, <clears throat> and a pedestrian-only clematis. Urban triage. As a city, you can very quickly control this, the safe walk. And the safe walk is the design of the streets, the striping of the streets, how fast cars are going, and how safe pedestrians feel next to them. In the long term, you can control these two. Oh, thank you. The comfortable walk and the interesting walk. Sorry, the comfortable, interesting walk and the useful walk. You can control them with your investment, with tax increment financing. You can control them with your zoning codes. But principally, it's the private sector that is creating the comfortable, interesting walk and the useful walk. And because they take time to change and they're difficult to change as a city, you have to look at those places where the walk is already, already comfortable and interesting and useful. Understanding that you can make it safe and those become your key pedestrian corridors. This is a study, it's called a frontage quality assessment. And we, we knew urbanists have been doing these for about 20 years. What you see is the experience I had being driven, I wasn't walking because it would have taken too long, being driven slowly down all of the streets in your downtown from an A to an F. And an A is bright yellow and an F is, is dark, dark brown. And the experience of being on those streets. And it makes you realize that even if you were to make the streets safer, even if you were to um, bring new buildings on those streets where there are missing teeth, it would be super, super expensive to improve some of them to a degree where they'll, tr they'll attract pedestrians. Now, these are the new buildings in your construction pipeline. This is amazing. Look how many buildings are currently expected by your planning department to come online. Amazing. That changes the map. Look what happens, right? They make the, the map better. So here's the map we're now looking at. Well, that map leads to this map. And this is what we call a primary and secondary network of walkability. This is the primary network, which is the best streets that connect to each other and to your important anchors. 
And this is the secondary network. And the best way of describing the secondary network is that, do you see the streets in gray? They'll never be good. <laughs> Not anytime soon. But the streets in green can and will be, will be good uh, before too long can be good before too long. So the message here is you focus first on the primary network because that's where you can generate, that's where you're already generating pedestrians and that's where you can generate pedestrians. Um, and then you look at the secondary network after you've completed the primary network. And you can see if you look carefully how one kind of leads to the other. This is not science, there's a little bit of, uh, of subjectivity here, but it was my best attempt to create a primary and secondary network based on the current quality of your streets. So that leads to this plan of your primary network. Now, why do I do this? Well, first of all, this suggests which streets you might invest in making more walkable first. Since they have the potential to attract walkers if they feel safe, this is where your investment might go first. But secondly, they tell you which missing teeth, which empty lots are most important to fill in. And there's a lot of them on this network. By the way, I work in a lot of different cities, and this is one of the biggest, most robust primary networks that I've worked on. The typical city where I work has a way to catch up with you guys. And not to, not to be com competitive here, but Fort Lauderdale's look nothing like this, let me tell you. I mean, this, you've come a long, long way. But that means there's about 30 buildings, you'll recognize some of these sites, 30 buildings that you need. The lighter colored ones are the ones that are already on the way. But the 30 red ones are buildings that complete this primary network. Now that's a ton of buildings, so can we be a little more precise? Well, this is a map of your key anchors in your downtown and the paths that connect them, I'll show you in a minute. You have your train station and intermodal hub and you have another, you, you have another train station coming with all aboard Florida. You have Clematis Street, clear anchor, and you have City Place, a clear anchor. You have the convention center and its hotel as clear anchors and you have the students to the south, people who are more likely to walk than the rest of you as an anchor to the south. So you put that all together and this is the anchors and paths diagram in your downtown. Now I'm taking those buildings and I'm lightening them up and now what you see in, in dark red are the only 17 building sites that remain. I would argue from a comfort and interest and useful walk perspective these are the 17 most important building sites in your downtown. Some of them are more important than others. This site which wrecks the corner of Clematis and your water park for what, 20 parking spaces? Is a real sore on the face of the city. This site, the mayor and I were speaking earlier about how hard it is to cross Quadrille on, 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 on uh, Clematis. And it is hard, but it's much harder because of this huge empty lot on the left side of Clematis that makes you not welcome as you walk north on Clematis, sorry, as, as you work, walk west on Clematis. And then there's this building <laughs> that, wrecks, that wrecks your key, look at this axis, the key axis here, I think, for tourists at least, is to go, I'm not getting an arrow, there we go, is the convention center and its hotel going through City Place to Clematis and down to the water. That's your key L-shaped tourist axis and you just lose everybody right here and especially right there. Now there's already plans for some of these other buildings. They're, they're, I'm not gonna say the proper, I understand this building is priced too high to match any reasonable expectation. I'm not gonna say what you should do, but it begins with eminent and ends with domain. <laughs> <coughs> now. I don't know if you can do that here and don't even answer me, but it's a really tough site. Now, all aboard Florida is a, is a tricky number. And I have to say, in their defense, I was fed a lot of scurrilous misinformation about bad stuff that was gonna happen with all aboard Florida in terms of how long we'd have to be waiting at crossings and all sorts of things that really didn't, didn't turn out to be true. What is true is that with this train they're bringing, they, are, they need to close, and I believe them. I've seen, the, I've seen the, the technical drawings. They need to close Datura and Avernia. And that is bad. There's no doubt that is bad. You know, I once hosted a mayor's institute where we had eight different mayors, in my old life, eight different mayors 
and it was hosted at UC Berkeley and the famous urbanist Alan Jacobs who wrote Great Streets was there and each, each designer, there are eight mayors and eight, eight designers, each designer is given 20 minutes to speak to the mayor, to speak to the mayors as a group. What do you feel American mayors need to know? And Alan Jacobs stood up and he said, never close a street and he sat down. He <laughs> said, so that's all I want to say so you remember it. Closing streets is bad for cities. But getting, high speed, getting a high speed rail stop in the heart of your downtown that connects directly to Orlando and to Miami is good for cities. And it's my understand, it's my feeling that it's a, probably a fair trade. But I want to call your attention to something else which is not what people are talking about very much, which is that the current site plan for the surrounding streets could well be a disaster. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. This is the plan now. This is not the plan, this is the reality as you look down on the site of the um, All Aboard Florida station. As best as I could tell from the drawings I saw, this is my redrawing of the plan for that site. And what you see here is something that's absolutely essential if this is going to be <clears throat> anything but a dead end area is a frontage road that's being proposed very wisely along this whole edge. Do you see that? So the grid is remaining intact. Without that, actually, Datura and Avernia become just a U, a dead end U reaching to the station. And it's very difficult to get from the station to Clematis or to Fern. So this frontage road is really important. But what you also see, even compared to what's there now, is a lot of buildings going away, right? and a big surface parking lot which is necessary to serve, well let's say it's parking that is necessary to serve the train station. So I want to call your attention to a couple things. Well let me just say here's, we'll get to that in a minute, okay. The main thing that troubles me about this drawing, and it's a delightful aspect of my career that I go from city to city, I offend people and move on. <laughs> This drawing, the streets seem to have been designed by someone who designs driveways and parking lots and not streets. So you have a street, I'm sorry I'm losing my arrow, there you go, you have a street which is here angle parking on one side, here no parking, here a pull out, here a pull out on both sides, here, you know, here there's no parking at all, here there's parking in some places, it's got this swoopy wiggly curves along its whole length. This is not what city streets look like. This is not what city streets look like when they invite pedestrians. A typical city street has simple geometries. It has parking along its entire length, typically on both sides. And look at this curvy, wervy intersection. It just feels like a suburban area. And this is something that, that matters to nobody, but it needs to be drawn by someone who understands this. And you've got two of the best urban design firms in the entire world in Miami, not to mention others in Florida. Um, someone like that needs to be on the job to make sure these streets turn out right. Now, the other thing, of course, <coughs> is the lack of building edges against these streets. To all aboard Florida's credit, this is just the short-term plan. They understand that there's a long-term plan that, to everyone's benefit, including theirs, will put buildings along all of these streets. But I want to be very precise about what it means to put buildings along these streets. So I want to say, what does all aboard Florida owe West Palm Beach. This is the important discussion. Apparently nothing. I've worked in lots of different cities. I'm not talking about them or their attitude. I've had perfectly nice meetings with them. But in lots of different cities, the guys who own the rail, they just do what they want and they can. It's very important to understand that. They can do what they want in many cases. There are ways to stop them, but they're extremely expensive and painful and they'll kill your, they'll kill your high speed rail. So the question isn't what they have to do. The question is what do they want to do? And what, I'm, what I want to lay out today is what I, what, what I believe, and you may not agree, I, I hope you will, a good citizen all aboard Florida will do. Good urban design, and what does that mean? Here's my redesign, my long-term redesign of this site. Now I should say this is not the design, this is a design. This is a design that was done with no discussion with any of the landowners with all aboard Florida, with any of the people who, who have a role in this property and probably does not meet the demands uh, for this property. But it, it has certain qualities that I think it's important to discuss. So here they are side by side. The first thing to, see, to, no, oops, the first thing to notice is what happens to the streets. 
See how the streets are now simple streets with simple angled geometries, no curves, no swoops. Here we're going from the existing angle parking to a parallel parking, but aside from that, they're simple double parked, sorry, two side park like clematis streets that go through the site. Secondly, you have building edges that make <clears throat> these are garages, right? This is a parking structure. This is another parking structure. This happens to be a surface parking lot. You have building edges that make Fern a delight, that make Clematis a delight. And by the way, these two buildings here are in the pipeline already. And then you have building edges that are more or less good, in this case, decent, because the garages are there. You know, these have to be a certain length to function properly. But you have decent, decent, not great, at least, building edges along Detora and Avernia. Now, I think most people who take this train are going to walk this way, north, or this way, south. So I think Detora and Avernia are less important as streets, but they're still streets nonetheless. So what does the good citizen plan look like? Real urban streets, not parking lot driveways. Proper building edges on all streets, not exposed parking decks or lots and then special attention to clematis, fern, and the frontage road. Uh, we'll talk about this in a minute. But you see there, the key streets again are clematis, the frontage road, and fern at the bottom, with these being a little less important. And of course, I should have said rosemary, of course rosemary uh, as well. I need to add that. And then 7th Street opened up. They're closing two streets in your downtown. They have no obligation to open anything up, but in fact, they have an opportunity to open up a street. 7th Street separates the Northwest Quadrant that we talked about before from the water, from the heart of the city, and there's no other connections between the East and the West from 3rd to Palm Beach Lakes, nothing. And then you can see from this aerial, there is a street there that just needs to be connected. Now, the neighbors have to want it, and I forgot to mention earlier, the neighbors also have to want two-waying their streets. You know, I presume from the success of the um, other neighborhoods that are two-way that they'll want that, but I don't want to presume. The neighbors have to want this, but I think that this is a better solution for the safety and the, of the neighborhood and the access of the neighborhood to the rest of the city. So, so again, this is not the plan. This is a plan that any new urbanist could have drawn and which a new urbanist should draw that will give us some guarantee that we won't have a miserable urban design solution around a train station, which I recommend that you accept. I also should mention the crossovers here that welcome you, that terminate the vista as you're heading west on Detora and on Avernia. These buildings which should have you know, prominent roof lines that welcome you as you come up the street and cross you over the track so that you don't have to go off your axis as a pedestrian like the one you currently have at your train station. Whew, glad that's over with. Now, street trees. This is a quick discussion. No one values street trees enough in American cities. If people understood what street trees do in terms of welcoming pedestrians, lowering urban heat islands, you know, each tree is worth eight air conditioners running full time all day in the typical American neighborhood. Absorbing storm water, absorbing CO2, absorbing ultraviolet, we do not value our street trees enough, but they're certainly important in terms of making that sidewalk feel comfortable, making the pedestrian feel safe, slowing cars down as well. Um, there's two things wrong with this image, one of which is quite obvious, and I heard a lot of people talking about how trees get planted and then left to die here, and don't feel bad, that happens all over America. But cities are now endowing their tree funds so that when they plant a tree, there's funds perpetually to maintain that tree. Because if you plant a tree without the funds to maintain it, you're throwing money away. So I hope you'll look hard and, hard and, and clear at that. The other thing is three words I want to share with you. Stop planting palms. <laughs> Palm trees. <laughs> to the city's credit, I believe this is already understood at a certain level. I don't believe that it's universally applied. Making, having palms does not make you unique. Every place in America that can plant palms does, and I know there's palm in your name, but <laughs> they do not, you know, a palm tree does not confer 
of the ecosystem service and the comfort and the safety that a standard tree does, what we call arboring trees, trees that reach across the road to form that canopy. And that's really all I have to say about that is to reemphasize what I imagine is already a direction here at the city. And then finally, the pet only clematis discussion. A lot of people are pushing for this. A lot of people are, are scared of it, don't want it. Um, turning, turning clematis street in the heart of downtown into a uh, pedestrian only street. My first comment is it ain't broke. It's one of the best streets of its type in Florida, or maybe in America. It's a fantastic street. It's working perfectly well as it is. And yes, you'd like more room for sidewalk dining. There's lots of things you would like, but it's working. And it works well. And this sort of friction, you get this on Ocean Drive and South Beach too, the sort of friction you get on the skinny sidewalk is why the people are there. Right? They like that. They want, to, they want propinquity, not to be spread out. There's the other discussion, which is the 95% rule. Of the 200 main streets that were pedestrianized in America in the 70s and 80s, 95% of them failed. And have now been, most of them have been converted back to traffic. So it is possible to make a successful pedestrian street in America. It's just very difficult and very unlikely. But we have a new lesson, which is to not make the same mistake that we made in the 70s and 80s, or 60s as well, and to do what New York City did, and just to try it out to pull some potted plants and trees onto the street, to pull some lawn chairs onto the street, do it for a few hours. I think you already do it on occasion, right? Expand the hours, do it on a Saturday, then do it on a Saturday and a Sunday. And if it's working, if it's making your merchants more money, then keep doing it. But just don't spend money on building it the wrong way, because then you have to spend money to convert it, which is why a lot of places like Memphis can't afford now to convert them back, even though they're really not successful. So I love the idea. I don't want you to get the wrong, the wrong impression. There are great examples in Miami Beach and elsewhere of these wonderful pedestrian streets. And I do like the idea. Uh, but my only suggestion is that you test it in dribs and drabs and see if it continues to be a vital solution for you. <clears throat> Our final category uh, is the useful walk. And that has to do with principally the mix of uses. I'm going to talk to you about key and transit. I'm going to talk to you about key transit, housing, and parking policy. Oh, and wayfinding as well. So key transit, um, you have this map. This map is your green line and your orange line, and the wonderful little trolley you have that I think adds a lot to the livability of your downtown. People use it. I've taken this map and I've transcribed it on my, my anchors and paths my key anchors and paths map. And um, I'm adding now, see in yellow, the new train station. The arrival of this train station changes the dynamics of your downtown, allows us to rethink this system. The system for me is a little confusing. If you, it's a little hard to read. I guess the easiest version might be this version. Both of the the systems, that, you know, the, the, the key to make a bus that's trying to function like a trolley, feel like a trolley, is to give it a route like a trolley and not a meandering bus-like route. You know, part of it is making it look like a trolley, but part of it is making it act like a trolley. And if it acts like a trolley, it'll tend not to have loops. Trolleys tend to be on the same street. Um, and it will tend to have a simple, simple route. And here your routes are kind of L-like, kind of wiggly, kind of C, kind of C-shaped. And what I'm suggesting also is that the loops, look how big the loops are. The, the general discussion now, and there's a wonderful uh, specialist named Jarrett Walker who wrote a book called Human Transit where he talks about this, is that loops, the, 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 the better understanding now is that people don't, they feel disoriented by loops and that loops do nothing to increase ridership. Even though they give you the perception that you're reaching near more addresses, they don't give the actuality of reaching near more addresses because you need to get to both sides of the train. To get, you need to get to the, to the vehicle in both directions. So they actually lengthen walks. They make the system more confusing. And they um, don't do anything to help with ridership. So these are your loops, which I'm suggesting getting rid of. And I'm proposing this system. And what this system shows, then, is a green line. Let's start with the yellow line. The yellow line no longer goes up to the Kravitz Center, except when there's a show. 
because there aren't that many shows. So you divert it at show start and show finish to get it there. But you take it really where it's supposed to go, which is to the convention center and the convention center hotel, which allows you to take a straight line right down Rosemary <coughs> and not divert onto Sapodilla, except when there's a show. There's a turnaround. And remember, this thing can maneuver like a, like a small truck. There's a turnaround at the hotel. Oops, hold on. Yeah, there's a turnaround at the hotel. And then you run all along Rosemary. You come east to get to the edge of the train station. And then you shift over to Clematis. <clears throat> and then you have a little loop. So this is kind of the tourist loop. It connects the Convention Center Hotel through City Place, sorry, down Rosemary, and then down Clematis to the water where it turns around very quickly. The other loop is the one that was, the other, the other, sorry, the other route is the one that was looping around through this neighborhood. And now it connects straight to the train station where it can make a three-point turn in the parking lot and come back. So now you know Datora is the street, not, you know, looping on many different streets, sorry. And um, comes down, again, goes by the train station right here, and then, uh, like in your current system, it's together with the other one for several blocks so that you can make a transfer. And then it heads down Dixie, you know, down Olive. Why Olive and not Dixie? Well, that's the straight path. First of all, it's more in central in this part of the downtown. It's further from the other loop. And remember, Dixie, remember Olive's two-way now, and it's taking you to the Norton Art Museum. Mostly so it can pick up all the students that are down here in this area. So it's a little bit longer, but it's more direct. So I'm recommending this transit map as opposed to this transit map. Um, it's just simpler. It feels more like a train. And then the other thing, of course, is frequency. And I think you need to commit. If you really want this to become a vehicle that's well used, as it is, you can clearly see at certain hours, it needs to go late into the night, as I guess it does on some nights. But the, the headway, really the key threshold for headway is about 12 minutes. If you've got to wait more than 12 minutes, you won't wait. Many people won't wait. So if that requires an additional vehicle or two, I really do recommend it. I think it'll pay off as this special. You have, a, you have a unique, <clears throat> you have not a unique condition, but you have kind of an unusual condition here where you've got a lot of cool things that just need to be connected better together and can be connected better together with this vehicle. So I'm very excited about that possibility. Now housing has to do with the mix of uses. Most places in America, you know, the, the most mixed, the most walkable places have the most mix of uses, like in Manhattan. And in most places where I work, Florida City's less so, but in most places where I work, the jobs housing balance is off dramatically in the downtown. Many more jobs than housing. You have the same thing, just not as much as other cities which don't have you know, beautiful views and water nearby that attract high-rise developers. But still, you have an undersupply of housing in your downtown. And you have an oversupply of parking in your downtown. Or I should say, let's put it differently. I always ask, what's missing or underrepresented in its housing? Then what is valuable and being wasted? And that is parking, specifically surface parking lots. Now, what do I mean by that? We can use garages to leverage housing. I understand that you've already made some forays in this direction. What I'm suggesting is a more formalized program, a more emphatic program that acknowledges the opportunities that your partly empty parking garages are offering you. I worked in Lowell, Massachusetts, where they had five <coughs> downtown lots that were half empty during the day and empty overnight, and they used it to develop thousands of loft apartments by assigning spaces in the garages to developers who could bring those spaces to their banks and say, look, my building is parked. I don't have to build parking, which, by the way, might cost 30% more than not building it, uh, because these parking spaces exist. So here's my very quick analysis. You've got the PD garage. The these are the city garages downtown. PD, Clematis, City Center, Avernia, and Banyan. Banyan is full. Okay. The other two, though, have significant daytime vacancies and principally larger weekend and evening vacancies. Doing the math, and the math involves r realizing that the tenants of a building, some will drive to work, some will not. So you need, to have, you need to have a bunch of spaces in a garage just to start. But then it helps to have more on the weekends and evenings because that's when people come home. <clears throat> so you want more spaces on the weekends and evenings available 
than during the day, and you need to have a certain number during the day. And on, based on that math, you've basically got room for 150 cars in the PD garage, 350 cars in the Clematis garage, 90 cars in the city center garage, and 300 cars in the Avernia garage. So for example, the Avernia garage, com combining this now with our uh, missing tooth diagram, the Avernia garage could put 300 apartments on these sites that we've determined need, ha need buildings. The city center garage could put 90 apartments on these sites which are in our missing tooth map. The Clematis garage could put 350 units on these streets. And again, the light green is the primary network of walkability and the dark green is the secondary network of walkability. And then finally, the PD garage could put 150 units near it. 890 units <coughs> could be floated by these empty spaces in your parking garage. So if you do the math, 30% discount on 890 units, that's a lot of money. So I'm only suggesting that you more emphatically pursue this opportunity to encourage more housing in your downtown by giving them, for a fee perhaps, but giving them the parking that no one's using in your garages. <clears throat> parking policy, this is Don Shoup. I've introduced you to him before. He wrote The High Cost of Free Parking. Um, it is clear to me, uh, and this is what a typical parking plan of the sort that cities have been doing now for a couple decades looks like. It is clear to me, in the same way that the laws of physics apply in West Palm Beach, that the laws of, of parking also apply in West Palm Beach. And what Don Shoup uh, outlines in his book very clearly and reminds us of is that the parking meter was invented by merchants, for merchants, to churn the cars on the curb, to make sure the wealthy shoppers could find a space to park, understanding that those with less money and more time are happy to circle and park further away, and to maximize the revenues from their businesses, you want to price parking around the clock at that price that will generate a certain amount of vacancies on all blocks at all time. And Don Shoup says, 85% occupancy. You want to have one empty space per block face. And that means, you, you know, and, and by the way, when you do that, and the way you convince the merchants who don't remember the history of parking and think that it's bad to charge more, the way you convince them is to do what they did in Pasadena, which is to use all the extra revenue. It's called a parking benefit district. To use all the extra revenue you get from the higher priced parking to pay for streetscape improvements, shop front improvements, rear alley improvements like they made in Pasadena, um, <clears throat> to spend it where the money is, is earned. In every place that the merchants have fought higher price parking and they've lost, the next day they've, they've thanked you. They say, we were wrong, thank you. Our businesses are doing better now that people can find parking near where we are. But it's kind of a two-part deal because the problem is that people aren't necessarily easy to find, they don't find it easy to find the parking structures. So we'll talk in a little bit, but you need, you, as you already know, and I know there's already discussion, there does need to be better wayfinding to get people to your structures. But the price of the parking on the street, you know, it can't end at 7 p.m. in a district where most of the crowding is at 9 p.m. And we all love to park free on Sundays, and I too feel perfectly gypped when I go to a meter and it's charging me on Sunday. But if you, want the, if you want the merchants to thrive, then you will price your parking to always have that level of vacancies. It means charging more for parking in certain places, and perhaps less in other places. But to have a what's called a demand-based pricing system for your parking. And then finally, wayfinding. I already talked about better wayfinding to your um, parking garages. In about half the cities I work in, I recommend this. Which is, a, which is a national campaign. It, it's, it's actually a for-profit company, um, but it's called Walk Your City. Half the places I work don't have clear destinations like yours do that need connecting well, that, that can benefit from better connection to each other. But it started out as guerrilla wayfinding, unsanctioned pl placement of signs around neighborhoods telling people in very cool modern graphics how far it would take them to walk to different places. But it's become embraced by different cities, including I, I introduced them to Santa Fe, and now there's a Santa Fe uh, program in the works. But basically, because you have things like the Norton and City Place, and Clematis Street that could so easily be connected better to each other. 
To have a system of signs like this which cost almost nothing, which probably lasts six months before you decide whether to replace them permanently or not um, in your downtown, I'm, I'm going to recommend that you all um, begin a campaign like this because again, unlike a lot of the places I work, there's a very clear application for it here that I think would be effective, for example, in, in convincing people shopping in City Place to come down to Clematis Street and maybe even vice versa. I'm more interested in the former but I think both are valuable and, and really helping people to jump the gap <coughs> across that really unpleasant building to get to Clematis, to cross, you know, to cross Quadrille and so finally is a small last feature I'm suggesting that. So that is it. I believe that's the entirety of my talk. I do want to say I've spent very little time congratulating you. Um, West Palm Beach though I believe and other planners in the room can back me up here. West Palm Beach I believe is, is one of the cities in America that has benefited the most from good planning. And maybe that's self-serving as me as a planner to say that. But there's a lot of cities in America that have had a lot of planning and I do not know a city really that's got more to show for it than West Palm Beach through three or four really great mayors starting with, you know, I knew when I joined DPZ in 93, they just finished the plan with Nancy Graham that fixed Clematis and did so many wonderful things and laid the groundwork of the code that allowed City Place to happen. But I mean, look at this. This is incredible. You've gotten color, first of all. <laughs> but second of all, I mean, look at this. Who else does this? I mean, it's, it's done, but really amazing what can be accomplished here. So I would argue it's time to move off the blocks perhaps a little bit. And while you know I've talked about buildings as well as roads, I think the, the place for improvement where you can do the most, the fastest, the cheapest and have the biggest impact is just this. You know, this is your public realm. This is where your people convene, where they get to know each other, where they shape your city as citizens and this is where I think you need to be spending your money and your attention. Um, so that's it. If you want to learn more, here's my book. I always show my Twitter handle if people are interested. <laughs> um, but this isn't about me. This is about you. <laughs> and. Um, Am I allowed to welcome questions from the commission? Yes, absolutely. First okay. of all, I want thank to you for your thank attention. you for a great presentation. <laughs> okay, we're going to start with questions from the commission. Uh, commissioners, what questions do you have? Commissioner Moffitt. Again, thank you for the presentation. Um, when you were talking about Flagler, I don't know if you know, that there are a lot of residents who um, would like to have crosswalks going over um, over Flagler and one one in particular is at, at Pine Street and I know I brought this up before at commission workshops and I've been told that it's not a really good place because it's where the the road um, changes from one speed to another so that's one of my questions is what do you think about crosswalks? Do you mean bridges? No. You just mean a well, crosswalk? Yeah. <clears throat> well I didn't study up at Pine because that's outside my study area. I know where it is, however. Okay, thank you. And um, is there a signal there? No. I mean, clearly, again, I'm speaking generically because I don't, I, I didn't even go up there. Okay. But typically when you have a waterfront street like that, well, first of all, calming it in the manner I've suggested will make a big difference. Secondly, you need to have periodic crossed, crosswalks probably signalized and may, maybe one of those cases where a push button makes sense just to get pedestrians across. Not every block, but certainly it's, it's very normal and considered a best practice to have regular crossings to get to the natural feature which is on the other side. So when you say regular, do you, can you give that a... Um, a well, in urban areas, it's every block. In residential areas, it's tougher to make the argument but for... But you're not talking about signalized crossing in every right. block. You're talking about like a pedestrian... Yeah. See, one of, one, I'm, no, go ahead. Um, one of the problems, particularly downtown <coughs> on Flagler, is there are pedestrian crosswalks there, but nobody obeys them. Right. If you're trying to cross, cars will zip right by you. And, you know, there's a sign that says pedestrian walk, and, and, there, and that's yeah. similar. There is a philosophy that you can reduce liability by having no crosswalk, because then if someone gets hit, it's not your fault. I think that's what However, I was told. However, <laughs> um, it is certainly safer, okay, I, I'm not going to speak with certainty because I haven't seen the studies. It is my understanding that it is safer to have the crosswalk than no crosswalk because at least cars are alerted to the presence of the pedestrian. But I, I think it's worth, it's actually, I'm sure there are studies that look into that and it's worth looking into. 
I, I was just in Fort Lauderdale, and what they had there was not a, a light in the middle of the road that would stop traffic, but a lighted crosswalk with flashing lights. Do, yeah. you, do you think that's a better way to do things? It is. It's expensive. You just need to decide where it's worth having them. Obviously, you're not going to pay for it everywhere. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Robinson? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Mayor. I, uh, I'm sitting in here having days of the when Ziskovich was talking about expanding his downtown, my concern was what happened earlier. We stopped at the FEC railroad track, and then we, we've gone across. And he recommended opening Doug, a division down to Banyan that would give that corridor a transit area. Then you've come and said something that is interesting the neighbors are talking about, opening up 7th Street across the waterway because otherwise that entire corridor from 3rd Street to 15th Street is landlocked mm -hmm. with only two areas to actually get downtown. So that 7th Street would give an ex east-west accessibility from really almost the water to the water mm -hmm. and division would bring it all the way down to division, uh, down to Banyan. And, you know, that is something to think about. You, you're going to have people walking rather than trying to hitch a ride with a jitney or something. Hadn't thought about that. Thank you. I'm very, I'm very uh, hopeful about that connection. And, and I like the two-waying of Division and Douglas. And I, I, it never made sense to me why they were one way. Yeah. I'm sure they weren't originally. Yeah, probably not. Other questions? Go ahead, Commissioner Moffitt. I thought it was real exciting when you were talking about taking 7th Street and bringing it through because that is uh, an historic street and we're doing a lot at 7th and um, um, Tamarind. Tamarind. Uh, and and I, I think that's a real nice, you know, entrance to the city. So I think it's a good connector. Good. Commissioner Matera? No. Okay. Um, I know that some of you in the audience might have questions and, and this is a workshop. Um, so if, if I'm going to just ask you to line up at the podium, I, I, I'm not going to do cards. Do I have to do cards? Can't I just have <coughs> line up? Is that okay? Yeah. If you want to ask a question, line up at this podium and we'll take whatever questions we can in the next 10 minutes. Anybody have a question? Come on. Come on, Lisa. <laughs> Lisa, come on up. <coughs> <clears throat> Start by saying your name. Uh, um, hi, I'm Lisa, I'm Lisa Conley. I'm a resident of uh, downtown, a little bit north of Palm Beach Lakes Boulevard at the Slade. And it's on Flagler. And I was just interested about the, the width, the, the, the time you spent about the width of the streets, the 10 feet versus the 12 feet. Could you give us an example of where that exists now that we could get a sense of scale of how wide that is? I believe Worth Avenue <laughs> is two 10-foot lanes and two 7-foot parking lanes. And I'm proposing mostly 10-foot and 8. But um, interestingly, Clematis and Rosemary, those, those lanes are a little bit wider. They function because they're such great streets for other reasons. But when you have a street which has, you know, less interest along it, less interruptions, and particularly multiple lanes, then the wider lane experience really kicks in in terms of, ex in terms of encouraging you to, to go faster. I mean, 10-foot streets used to be the absolute standard. So you'll find them all over. The, the one that I know, because I've shared it elsewhere, and I paced it recently, is Worth Avenue. But bear in mind, Worth Avenue is two one-way lanes. Right. And by the way, Worth Avenue is one of those great exceptions to the rule. <laughs> There's about five of them, of one-way streets that are great for retail. Right, but um, so, I think Worth Avenue would be much more effective as a two-way street. Uh, that was my other question. <laughs> yeah. um, the, one other question I would have, so th most of the areas that you proposed in your study were 10 foot and 7 foot, correct? Uh, mostly 10 and 8. 10 and 8. I recommended 7 on Rosemary for that one stretch, I think it's north of 3rd, where there's only room for a limited amount of, of parking. And a car is, you know, cars are 6 feet wide. Parking spaces used to normally be seven feet. The standard, again, they all escalate. If you keep, take your eye off a standard for a minute, you turn back, it's gone up a foot. But most cars are six feet wide. Seven feet where there's no snow is a perfectly reasonable parking standard. But often if your street is wide, I'll go with eight just because it, it uses up more pavement so the travel lane can be narrower. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. I, you know, I think the data is so interesting that you showed where narrowing, you know, doing the road diet, narrowing lanes does not affect the capacity um, in the areas that you measured. So I thought it's that important. The, the, the principal reason for that, if you think about the traffic that you encounter on Okeechobee, it's because of the signals. Right, you're slowed down because you're waiting at signals, and the car, you're waiting for the cars in front of you that are waiting at signals. You're not slowing down because of any friction from your side. And the lanes would have to be eight feet or narrower for you to really be slowed by the friction of vehicles. Okay. Commissioner Terry? Thank you. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if I have a, a question for you or the mayor, actually, so I'll, I'll ask and whoever can answer. So what I found, one, well, the whole thing was very fascinating, and I hope that you're going to give this back to us in a form with yes, uh, you report. Know, things that need to get checked off the list because it's easier that way. Uh, my specific question is the area around the perimeter road around the new train station that's going to be The frontage road. Right, that frontage road. So I suspect that that's a city road, correct? Yeah, well, once it's, <clears throat> it doesn't exist yet. Once it exists, I suspect it would. Would it be a city road, Rick? Yep. So we, the city has the opportunity to make the suggestions and the changes, and um, <clears throat> as long as we do what is in our purview and what our standards are, yes, I appreciate that you're going back to that, yeah. then, then we can make that happen pretty easily. Right. I would think so, yeah. I'm, I'm imagining it's a city street, um, but as often happens, it'll, there are often, you know, the private landowner is often deeply involved in the design, so... <clears throat> so yeah, what I'm suggesting there, I'll compare the two. Yeah, yeah that was the, a the good difference, slide. The, the difference between these two plans in terms of the streets, I hope, is clear. Just simple, you know, 34 to 36 foot wide streets that you can park on both sides of um, that look like streets. And if you need a drop off in front of the train station, then you just mark no parking along part of that parking lane and that becomes the drop off area. But the idea that the curb has to wig keep wiggling in and out in response to spot needs is not an urban street solution. Thank you. Yeah. I think um, I just want to say something about um, All Aboard Florida. You know, we have been working very collaboratively with them, um, and I think um, our team and All Aboard Florida team meet on a regular basis, and, and these are um, constant topics of discussion. So, Commissioner Moffitt. When you were talking about bike lanes and you talked about having um, a buffer for them, a curbing? Yes, there are all sorts of point. solutions. I mean, if it's, if it's a really dangerous street like Okeechobee, I recommend a, a, basically a high curb, like a small Jersey barrier. How high? Maybe, I mean, 18 inches or something. Just that the, if a car hits it at a glancing blow, it'll bounce off. Um, for areas like, um, you know, for, for streets that are a little bit slower speed, <clears throat> like, for example, Rosemary, mm -hmm. um, you could put just striping in the pavement and then these vertical detachable posts that are the standard for these. Or you can put in, for example, um, parking lot wheel stops, you know, those things that sit in parking lots that just keep you from rolling out of your spot oh. at the front, something like that. So the less speed of the road, the m less emphatic and expensive the infrastructure has to be. Does your plan show w where we need them and where we don't? Yes, they, I mean, they, in, in the report, I'll, I, I outline that. Thank you. We um, expect to get Mr. Speck's report in a month or so, um, at which point we will have a group of people come together, um, a, a cross-disciplinary group of people, um, to lay out some plans for implementation. Um, you know, picking uh, which should come first and how we could address what. But we'll have a group, um, a, a team of our um, people and DDA people um, to work on this to move forward. Thank you so much. This has been Thank you all. really terrific. Um, <laughs> we will reconvene at 5 o'clock for the City Commission meeting.